Amen. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would please look at verse number 19. A very simple statement here. He says, quench not the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. Now to quench means to put out something like put out a fire. If there was a fire on the stage and somebody brought a wet blanket and threw over the fire, it would certainly quench the fire. It would suffocate it, right? It would prevent it from being on fire. He's trying to tell us in a sense that we need to keep that spiritual fire that God's given you in your heart, keep that fire and don't lose your fire. We live in a time where a lot of Christians today, they're, they're kind of growing dim. Their flame has reduced to just about nothing. They're not on fire for the Lord anymore. They've quenched the Spirit because they're not really doing it God's way. He gives us some great verses right in this passage that give us an indication of how to keep your fire going and how to be on fire for God and how to make sure that we don't allow Satan to quench our fire, our spiritual fire for the Lord. And I want to tell you, listen, don't quench your fire. Don't put out the fire. Don't lose your zeal for the Lord. And you know what? But don't do that to others as well. Don't put my fire out. Don't put your wife's fire out. Don't put your husband's fire out. Don't put your friend's fire out. Quench not the Spirit. I want you to understand this concept of fire, how powerful it is. When he says, quench not the Spirit, you know, in uh, Ephesians 4, verse 30, he says, grieve not the Spirit. Too many Christians, they ignore God and they're grieving the Spirit. Here he says, quench not the Spirit. Don't let the fire grow dim. Don't let it go out. In this, in this same passage in chapter 5, if you would look at verse number, uh, verse number 4, he says, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light. We're called the children of light. Think about it. You have God's light inside of you. You are a child of light. And he says, quench not the spirit. He's saying, don't let that light go out. Don't let that fire go out. You're all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Uh, most Christians are frankly, they're asleep, they're drunk, they're not watching, they're not sober, they're not looking, they're not paying attention to things spiritually. They have quenched the Spirit. They've quenched the Spirit. If you would go to John chapter 1, please. In Psalm 104 it says, Who maketh His angels spirits, He says, His ministers a flaming fire. We are called to minister to people, which means to serve them. And God says we need to have a flaming fire about it. We are in a spiritual sense, right? There's a candle of the Lord inside of you. He's searching the inward parts. It's the Spirit. And is your spirit on fire? Or have you quenched the Spirit? Fire in this sense, I'm using it, it means enthusiasm or excitement or zeal. Are you on fire for the things of the Lord? Or frankly, are, are you just, do you, I mean, do you have a willingness to witness? Or are you just bored with the things of God and you can't wait to move on and get back to staring at your phone or watching TV or something? Because the devil is putting distractions in front of us all the time. And God has put us on this earth for one reason, and that's to glorify Him. And He's asked us to witness to others to shine that light in the darkness and tell them that Christ saves. And most Christians, they've just kind of quenched the Spirit. They've put out the fire. They're going back to the darkness. There are many today that sit in darkness. They're without Christ. They're lost. They're dead in their sin. And we've been called to preach the Gospel to them. In John chapter 1, we see this of the Lord. I want you to look at verse number 1. John chapter 1, verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Look at verse 4. In Him was life. He's talking about Jesus. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In a sense, he's saying, when you're born, you have like a little candle inside of you that's burning. And there's a light inside of you. God lit it. And one day, as a vapor, that candle's going to go out. And your time is up here. 
He's talking about spiritual awakeness in a sense, and he's talking about that you have the light of God inside of you. Every one of us, when we're born, we are lit up by that fire from God's Holy Spirit. This light that he speaks of, he calls it life. In Genesis 1.1, he says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. If you remember, darkness came first. We were in darkness, and now we're called into His marvelous light, right? We get saved out of the darkness. He says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The first statement that God makes in the Bible, He says, Let there be light, right? So when you're saved, that light, I mean, it is shining, and it needs to keep growing. In Genesis 1-4, He says, And God saw the light, that it was good. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. You know, as a Christian, we need to keep our light separate from the dark. God made day and night, and they're completely separate. You notice they don't really happen at the same time. I mean, they're totally separate. God's trying to tell us to keep your light bright because the darkness is very dark. In 1 John, in 1 John 1, 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. So think about what we're seeing here in John. Every man's born with some light. That light is Jesus Christ. He lights the whole world. God is light. And here's the message this morning, quench not the Spirit. Don't let your light go out. Have you lost your fire for the Lord? Are you fired up for the things of God? Or do you get more excited about the things of this world? Look at the next verse, verse number 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now, John the Baptist gives us this perfect example. And uh, look, just because we're Baptist, you know, we're not off the hook. Let's follow John the Baptist, that first Baptist. And you know what he came to do? Look what it says. It says, to bear witness of the light. Why? That all men might believe. You know what your job is? It's to bear witness of the light, which is Jesus Christ, that people might believe on him. That's our purpose in this world. Verse 8, he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh in the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Jesus, as your creator, has given you a spiritual light when you're born again. And this is a different light than just the light of life. Now you have something special. If you would go to John chapter 3. Go ahead a couple passages. Go to John chapter 3. I want you to have this John the Baptist philosophy. In Luke 1, in speaking of Jesus, it says, "...to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace." Jesus came to give light unto the world. A very simple statement, but when you think about the connection, He says, quench not the Spirit. He says, there's a light inside of you, and I just ask you a simple question, are you on fire for God? And if you can't say yes, then I think that that means maybe you've, maybe you've lost your fire for God. Listen, the world is going to wax colder and colder, and we need to be brighter and brighter. There are those that need to see this light. In John chapter 3, if you would, look at verse number 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he, not, he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Think about this condemnation. We're all guilty of sin. We've all broken God's law. We all deserve the punishment. But he says there are some that will not believe the gospel. They will not come to the light because they love the darkness more. Why? Because look what it says. Their deeds were evil. 
For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Are you doing truth? Isn't what an interesting statement? Are you doing truth? What's that mean? Well, I'm coming closer to God that I can see my darkness and get rid of the darkness that's in my light. Uh, go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. I want you to see this in 1 Samuel chapter 3. I want to show you Eli, a man that lost his fire for the Lord. He lost his light. He lost his testimony. And because he lost these things, it hurt other people around him. It tore down his family. It put darkness in his family. It hurt his nation. Other people near him suffered because he lost his zeal for the Lord. He was no longer on fire for the Lord as he should be. 1 Samuel chapter 3. God's will is that we would clean up our life and Keep this light burning. Keep it burning. 1 Samuel chapter 3, look at verse number 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Let's break this down. The word of the Lord, hearing from God. It was precious. That means rare, hard to find, super valuable. You want some gravel? We've got plenty of it for free. You want a diamond? There's a few ladies that have some in here. They're not going to give it up very easily, okay? It's precious. That's a precious stone. In the same way, the Word of God was precious. That Word was not found like a common thing, right? Look what he says. The Word was of the Lord was precious in those days, and there was no open vision. Once you have the Word of the Lord, it will open your eyes. It's like shining a flashlight, and all of a sudden you have the vision. You can see where to go. You know what God's will is. You understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, here, they didn't have the Word of God. They were in darkness. They couldn't see where to go. They didn't understand what God's will is. The problem with human beings is we suffer from a short-term uh, memory. What do, you, what, what, do you, what do you call it? You guys know what I'm talking about. We forget things, right? In Hebrews, he says, uh, we've let things slip. There are verses in the Bible that are in your heart, and you wouldn't, if I said, write down every verse you know, oh man, okay, and you did it. There are still verses in there you've forgotten about that are in there that when you read it, you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember this one. That was a good one. I like that, right? Let's not forget. Let's keep stoking the fire. Let's put another log on the fire. Let's get some zeal for the Lord. Here, Eli, this warning is that he lost his vision. Look at verse 2. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. Again, he suffered from spiritual blindness, and it affected everyone around him. His family died a miserable death because he was spiritually blind. The next verse, verse 3. And ere the lamp of God went out of the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And what he's doing, he's introducing, and here's Samuel, we're going to see the Lord call Samuel. The vision was God, the word was gone, the light was going out. Wait, the light was going out? The lamp of God was going out. Did you know that they had a perpetual commandment to keep that light burning forever? But Eli just let it go out every night. He kind of got lazy lackadaisical, little careless. I can't be bothered. I've got to go to sleep. It's time for me to rest. That's too much work to get up in the middle of the light and restoke the fire and relight the candle. I'm not going to do it. He made very poor decisions. Exodus 27, it says, uh, to cause the lamp to burn always. It says, from evening to morning. It says it was a statue forever. It says something very similar in Leviticus. They were commanded to keep that light on at all times. It was a picture of eternal salvation. It doesn't go out. It doesn't go away. You have an eternal soul, and it's kind of like a little candle. It's going to last forever. Here, Eli had let the fire go out. He lost his fire. He lost his zeal. 
He lost his enthusiasm. He quit doing it God's way, and he got lazy in life. If you would go to Matthew chapter 4. If you would please go to Matthew chapter 4. Have you lost your fire? Have you lost your zeal? Is your fire going out? Are you wore out and tired of doing the same thing over and over? Do you feel like the work of the Lord is too much of a burden for you? The joy of the Lord is my strength. There is true joy when you get in God's will and you figure out what God's purpose is. And you know what? This world is going to keep attacking us. The devil's shooting his arrows. We're under attack. We're wore out. We're only getting older and older. Was that you, Brother Ross, that said amen? I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're only going to get older and older and our body's going to hurt. And, and you know what? We're just, oh man, you know, I'm, I don't want to go the extra mile anymore. I don't want to speak up anymore. I don't want to rise early anymore. I don't want to read the Bible anymore. Why would I sit and pray for an hour? Have you lost your fire? You're in Matthew chapter 5. I want you to see this. This is our calling. This is a commandment from God. If you'll find verse number 14. We live in a dark world, right? In verse 14, he says, Ye are the light of the world. Now, wait a minute. He said he was the light. Yeah, and he's in us. Now he says, you're the light. He says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. We turn on the lights so everybody can see. He says, God's light is inside of you. That fire is burning. Don't put it under a bushel. Don't put it under a basket. Don't hide it in a box. Don't go put it out and extinguish it. Don't quench the spirit, the fire that's inside of you. No, in fact, quite the opposite. He says, you need to shine that light that all may see it. Men are dying in darkness. Verse 16, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light shine to other people. Have you lost that? Have you quenched the Spirit? If you would, go to Luke chapter 11. Look, we're not saved by works, but he says you've got God's light inside of you, that fire, that Spirit. He says you need to shine it brightly so that others can see so they don't stumble. You know, I, I carry a flashlight with me everywhere, and inevitably I use it every day. You know what I, I found, though? The days that I don't carry my flashlight, I don't use it. <laughs> but I have discovered that inevitably about every single day that I carry a flashlight, I need it. By the end of the night, I'm going to use this flashlight. I've already used it this morning. It's neat how, I mean, it's just a tiny little flashlight, but, you know, I mean, we'll walk around as, oh, here, watch your, you know, I mean, uh, when we go to shut the building down tonight, we turn on, you know, the kids will lock, oh, wait, oh, you got to go back there, and here, watch where you're stepping, go over there. Isn't it nice, men, to have a flashlight to protect your children? Hey, watch where you're going to help guide your wife, Right? Or to see what you're really looking at if you're working on something. And just as many of you would say the same thing, you know, I always carry a pocket knife and most days I need it, but that one day I don't. Man, that's the day I really needed it. Now think about this an aspect of the spiritual light that's inside of you. God has lit a fire in your heart. Now he, he's going to give us a warning because the world, uh, you know, the devil, he is an imitator. And he wants to extinguish your fire. He has an artificial light. He has a dark light. You know what a dark light is? Is that even possible? Did you know, scientifically speaking, the hottest flame that burns is black? There is a black flame that's completely invisible. Oh, that's interesting. Kind of like the outer darkness. Hmm. Where the worm dieth not. It's interesting that darkness is a flame. You can have a dark flame, right? You're in Luke chapter 11. I'm going to show you this warning. Look at verse number 35. Luke 11, verse 35. 
Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Now, wait a minute. We've all got a light, right? There's a fire burning inside of you that's motivating you. It's kicking that engine up, and that's what's moving you along, right? And he says, be careful that that light isn't a dark light. You know, the screen on your phone or your TV, in a sense, it's kind of a dark light. We were out soul winning a while back, and we knocked on somebody's door, and they came to the door, and they cussed at me. Oh, man! Ugh. The football's on! You know what was driving his engine? You know what he was fired up for? Football! The Jags, right? Now look, if, if you watch the Jacksonville Jaguars, I am not saying you're in sin. I'm not putting you down, right? However, if you skip church to watch football, you better be careful. You're going to have to deal with God on that one. That's not right. God has called us to certain things, and I don't care how great the football gets. And fill in the blank. If you skip church because you want to play a game on your phone, because you're playing with some dark light, if you skip church because you've got a new hobby and it's riding your new bike and you want to go down here on the Baldwin Trail and, man, I'm just going to run this thing all day. That's what I'm excited for. Is that what burns inside of your belly? Is that what stirs you up and gets you fired up? Is your hobby, your habits, your entertainment? We live in a time where Satan knows how to keep Christians from doing anything good for God. He gives them some great distractions. Have you guys seen some of these distractions? Boy, they're fantastic. They are physically addictive. They just make your body want more and more and more. I'm here to warn you, make sure the light that burns within you is not a dark light. If, you're, if you would skip a birthday party to play a game or skip church to watch football, Ignore your spouse or your parent because you're more fascinated with something else. What kind of light is burning in you? When's the last time you were in public and somebody said, oh, praise the Lord, and you got excited like somebody just scored a touchdown? Can you imagine? I've done this before, and it, this one time it wasn't the response they expected. Some people use God's name in vain and they don't even think about it. Other people use it very specifically and targeted because they want an opportunity to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, well, that's good. Praise the Lord. Whoa! I mean, can you imagine if you were like, amen? And they're like, whoa, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, well, you're praising the Lord. We ought to praise the Lord. Do you get excited when there's an opportunity to praise the Lord? Or do you get excited when it's time to uh, do your exercises or, or your, what, I mean, what is it, your karate, ride your bike, ride your dirt bike? What is it? I mean, there's, I mean, we all have, I mean, hey, we're going to the range. We're going to shoot some guns today. Woo! Come on, let's go to church. Oh, man. Again. They'll be there next week. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good work. He says, quench not the Spirit. He says His ministers are a flaming fire. When's the last time somebody said the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you got so excited that you were, yeah! Jesus! Amen! It just doesn't happen, does it? We live in a day when it's not, it's not really politically correct to get excited for the things of the Lord. You can get excited for anything else in this world but don't speak up on Christ's behalf. You might offend a stranger. Have you lost your fire? Do you still have some zeal for the Lord? If you would go to... No, no, you're in Luke 11. Let's read it again in verse 35. Look, he says, Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. You know, you know what dark light is? When Christians are running around saying, Yeah, let's go to war. Let's go kill them so they don't come over here. That's dark light. 
Christians are called to be peacemakers. You know what we're called to talk about? Not everything that comes across the news. We're called to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and get excited for Him and preach His gospel of peace. That's what we're called to do. Look at the next verse, verse 36. He says, If thy body be whole, therefore, if thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no dark part, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Go to the next chapter. Go to chapter 12. God wants your whole body to be full of light. And I want to encourage you to crank it up. I mean, fire it up. I mean, find that little switch inside of you and turn it up and you talk to the Lord. You say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been apathetic, but I want to be excited for the things of the Lord. I want to rejoice when I hear the name of Jesus. I want to say amen when I hear somebody say something good about God. I don't want to be ashamed of you. I don't want to be out of season. I want to be instant in season and out of season. I want to get other people excited for God. In Luke chapter 12, go to verse 34. We're dealing with our calling here, our calling in this life. Luke 12, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. What a statement. He says, let your lights be burning. Don't let the fire go out. Don't lose your zeal for the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to speak up and get excited for the things of God. Let your loins be girded about and your lights be burning. If you would, go to Hebrews chapter 5. I want to give you a couple simple solutions this morning. If you say, you say, Pastor Fanta, my light is just not as bright as it once was, and I want to keep my lights a burning as God has commanded us. You know, of John the Baptist, it says that he was a burning and a shining light. What a testimony of that man. When we get to heaven and we meet him, God told us that he was a burning and a shining light. He says his ministers are like a flame of fire. And I'm just asking you, don't quench the spirit. Instead, get fired up for God. And I don't care who you offend in this world because let me tell you if you don't speak up for them and they end up in hell then they'll really be offended we have a chance now I want to show you a solution in Hebrews chapter 5 Hebrews chapter 5 look at verse number 12 for when the time ye ought to be teachers ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become as such that have need of milk and not strong meat. He says, you've been around long enough. You've been doing this Christian thing long enough. You've been in the Word of God long enough. You ought to be a teacher. Instead, it's like, I've got to give you some milk because you can't handle the meat. We're going back to the first principles what does baptism represent again? I heard about this years ago. Some preacher preached on it. I forget what he said. You need to find out for yourself. You need to figure out the Bible doctrine for yourself. You've got to put in the work for yourself. You've got to get fired up for the Word of God. This is where it's at. Verse 13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even though those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, do you have an exercise regiment? Yes, sir. I get up at 5 o'clock. I do 100 push-ups. I run around the block. Woo! Yeah, excited for exercise. Do you have a spiritual exercise regiment? Man, I get up early, I read 10 chapters of the Bible, I pray for an hour, I pray for my friends, I pray for my enemies, I pray for my coworkers, I pray for my boss, I pray for my lost family. Yeah, I get excited for God. I mean, think about it. He's talking about exercising your senses by reason of use. If you don't pick this up, when you do, you're going to be like, oh, this is so heavy and strong, I feel like a baby. He says, yeah, don't be a baby, you should be a teacher by now. You should be able to handle strong meat. And listen, don't compare yourselves to others. There are people that go around, oh, I've read the Bible 55 times. How many of you? You know, it's like, whoa, man. Don't compare yourself to others. I'm just asking you to live up to God's standard for you. Not, are you keeping up with the Joneses? Are you keeping up with what God's will is for you? God has a plan for you. He wants you to be on fire. He wants you to be a burning and a shining light while you're here. 
if you would go to Hebrews chapter 10. Are your senses exercised to discern both good and evil? Here's the problem. Most Christians get to this point where they're like, I don't know, is that a sin? And it's like, have you not read your Bible lately? How do you not know this is a sin? Is it, this is like first grader type stuff. It's like Christianity 101. They're like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, it, can you give me a verse? Can you, can you give me a sermon? Glad to. That's what church is about because we suffer from short-term memory loss and long-term memory loss and we forget things and we let things slip and we get lazy on things and we let our fire grow dim and cold, don't we? Hebrews chapter 10, find verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. I, I want to give you a couple let us statements as the solution. You say, how can I get fired up for God and make sure that when I stand before Him, He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hey, you're like John the Baptist, a burning and a shining light. How can I make sure of that? Let me give you some let us statements. He says here, let us draw near. He, hey, get close to God. Make time to get close to God. And notice He says, with a true heart, that doesn't mean Oh, does everybody see me praying? See how holy I am? Oh, oh, you see me? I'm praying over lunch. No, draw nigh out of a true heart. You know, you can, you can pray to the Lord all day. He says pray without ceasing. That was in 1 Thessalonians 5 we are at earlier. I mean, that means pray all the time. He says rejoice evermore. 1 Thessalonians 5 has all the answers, but we're not going to go there today. If you want some homework and you say, Pastor Fan, I've lost my fire. How can I be a burning and a shining light? 1 Thessalonians 5, it has it all. But let me give you a couple out of Hebrews with these let us statements. Let us draw near to God out of a true heart, being honest with Him, being honest with who we are, having full assurance, hey, once I'm saved, I'm always saved. My trust is in Him. It's not in myself. He says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. He's not saying when you get baptized, your sins are in the water. Brother Jake would always joke about that. You know, he's like, we baptize somebody, and he's like, careful, we're pouring those sins out. You know, we're going to put them down in the drain, you know. Uh, that this, our, our sins are not washed away by water. He's talking about being in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, you're, let your conscience, work on your conscience. That's how God talks to you through that still, small voice. And he's saying, draw nigh to God. And what's he say elsewhere? And he will draw nigh unto you. That's his promise. Okay, how can I keep that fire burning and not lose my zeal? Draw nigh unto God. Make time to get close to God. Just set it apart. Look at the next verse. Verse 23, let us, here's another one, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You know what that means? Hold on to what you got. When it says hold on fast, that means like, I mean, you ever seen him in basketball when the guy's like using his elbows, boxing them out? Like, you're not getting this thing from me, buddy. I mean, that, here's what he's talking about. Don't let anybody talk you out of what you believe. Don't let anybody talk you out of reading the Bible, going to church, believing on Jesus. Don't listen to that stuff. No, not for a minute. Keep it away. He says, hold fast your profession of faith. Don't waver. Don't be up and down. Oh, well, I guess I'll be a Christian today. No, not this week. I'm going to go live for myself. That's a miserable existence. That's quenching your own spirit and putting out your fire. Verse 24, and let us, here's another one, look at it. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. You know one of the best ways you can help yourself is to help someone else. Consider someone else. Pray for someone else. Serve someone else. It doesn't come naturally. It comes spiritually. We have to work at it. Consider one another. Provoke unto love and good works. I love this word provoke. Uh, many Bibles change that. They don't like the word provoke. When we think of provoke, we think of instigate. But it also has that definition of kind of encourage and motivate and point in the right direction. And this is the one place in the Bible it's used. It says provoke unto love and provoke unto good works. When I think of provoke, I think of a guy coming up and putting his fingers in my chest. Hey, buddy, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? I'm provoking a fight, right? Well, he says, go to your, bro your fellow brother and sister in Christ and provoke them to love one another. Provoke them 
to good works. Hey man, you're saved and you don't have to suffer with that sin. Don't you know you can do better than that? Don't you know we can serve God together? Hey, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Provoke them unto good works. You say, what does that look like? When he says, let us provoke them unto good works, what does that look like? Look at the next verse. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Isn't it something where this was written 2,000 years ago, and he said that day is approaching, the day of Christ, and because of that, there are people that are getting lazy and they don't want to go to church. They forsake the gathering. They forsake assembling. As the manner of some is, but exhorting. So let us, here's the word, exhort. The best word for exhort in our common day language is to motivate. Motivate. Let us motivate fellow brothers and sisters to gather together. That's what he's saying. If you will, go to the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 12. Let me give you a couple more let us and we'll be finished here. A couple more of these let us statements. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. Let us consider one another. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, here it is, look guys, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Now, can you imagine a ship trying to go full steam ahead while it has the anchor in the sand? That weight is drawing them and slowing them down. Can you imagine? Hey, I got to go. Let's go get in the car. And you put on the parking brake and then you gun it. I mean, it's like, what are you doing? You're giving mixed signals. You got the brake on and you're trying to pedal to the metal. It doesn't add up. He's saying, we have these weights which, which beset us. They put us behind. They're holding us back. It's called sin. And the problem is, God's given us the power over these sins through the Holy Spirit. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And we give in to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and we don't do what God has in design for us. Let us lay aside every weight, the sin. Look what he says after that in Hebrews 12.1. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now this one's cool. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. If I set you on a course and I say, uh, Brother Paul, I want you to leave from here. I want you to go up to the Jacksonville Trail. I want you to go 12 miles all the way down and come 12 miles all the way back. And then I want you to come here. Yes, and you gave me this look like, <sighs> and I said, and I want you to do it by next Friday. You'd say, no problem. <laughs> I'll get started right now. Here we go. Right now, if I said, I need you to do it by five o'clock tonight, you'd say, go. <laughs> right. Well, he says, let us run with patience. We are running a race. There is a finish line. God has a finish line for you, and most Christians will not finish their course. They'll stop halfway, heaved over. <gasps> I need some living water. <sighs> yeah, you should, have, you should have took the word with you. Run with patience. Run with patience. Just pace yourself. Don't be one of those bottle rocket Christians. Don't we have a tendency to do that? You guys know what I'm talking about? Woo! Oh, psh. No, I'm fizzled out. Man, I've seen it over and over and over and over for decades. Somebody gets back on fire for the Lord and they don't run with patience. They don't set the course. They don't consider, I need landmarks. I need mile markers. I need to know what my waypoints are. I need to know when I'm going to rest. And I need, I need to know what my goals are so I can accomplish them. They just take off. <laughs> Man, I'm on fire. I want to do this. Yeah, I want to, I'm, going to, I'm going to teach Sunday school. Hey, we're all, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to knock on doors. Hey, come in. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to read all the Bible this week. And it's like, where'd he go? I don't know. He won't take my call. He told me how great he was and how much he wanted to do for the Lord. And he was going to serve this church. And why, if I could, I'd buy the whole building for y'all. And I want to buy it. I'm going to do this. I want to do that. And where'd they go? They didn't run with patience. God's right there with you. Your pace is not my pace. Your race is not my race. We all have a different destination, and we got to figure it out. Figure out what that course is. Okay, Lord, where's my end? What does that look like? How do I know when I've finished my course 
and you're pleased with me so that when you receive me, you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There are things that y'all still have left to do, me as well. There are, most of y'all, adults are about my age. There's a lot that have a whole lot of a race to run, don't they? Some of y'all are twice my age and you don't have a lot left to run, but I'm here to encourage you, run with patience. You don't have to run like I do. You're not going where I am. But God has a plan for you. Don't miss your opportunity. God has a plan. He says, let us run with patience. We're almost done. Look at this. Jump ahead to verse 28. Go down to verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. If we're supposed to be a burning and a shining light, and we're supposed to make sure we don't quench the Spirit, and God says, hey, I am the light, and He says, I am a consuming fire. He says, why don't you show some grace to others? This is one of the biggest hindrances to the Christian walk. It's somebody else. How many of you can tell me that you ran into somebody that said, oh, I used to go to church, but I don't anymore because of, and they basically said, somebody else. Oh, yeah. Time after time again. Oh, you're not going to believe what those people did to me. <laughs> well, I probably would, and I'm sorry, but let's not judge God for that, and let's just not write off all of church for that, because now you're missing your opportunity to actually gather together. You're missing your opportunity to worship the Lord corporately as a congregation, as He's commanded us to do it. He says, lift up your voice. He says, pray without ceasing. He says, rejoice evermore. And those are simple things. He says, quench not the Spirit. But most have forgotten that because they don't hear it. You come here to church not so I can tell you some new thing you've never heard. You come here to be reminded of the first principles. Many of these things you already knew. You just need somebody to reach in there and turn your fire up a little. Have you lost your fire? Have you lost your zeal? I want to encourage you to get back to the first principles. Hit the reset. One last thing. Go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, and we're done. Proverbs chapter 4, if you would, find verse number 18. Now this is a song. Um, we have it in psalm form. We do sing it. And I, if you want to, I'll send you the MP3 file or I can send you a link to the YouTube video. This is a song that you can take with you that ought to motivate you. Look at verse number 18. It says, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You're saved, you're justified by the Lord Jesus Christ. Your path on your course, on your race that you're running, it's supposed to get brighter. It's not supposed to fade out. We have an eternal fire inside of us fueled by the Holy Spirit. And He doesn't lose energy. He doesn't lose steam. If we'll let Him, He'll help us get brighter and brighter as we go on our path. Look at it again. He says, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness, and they know not at what they stumble. Christian, listen to me. God's will is that you would shine more and more. That you would be a burning and a shining light. You're going to be bright as the Lord Jesus Christ in the resurrection, you're going to look like a celestial body when you resurrect. So why not now? Why not just let the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shine through every aspect of your life? Why don't you let it shine through your smile? Why don't you let it shine through your testimony? Why don't you let it shine through your words? Why don't you get fired up for God and quit caring about the rest of the stuff in this world? God has a plan for you. I pray that we'll find it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we need your help, Lord. 
Lord, I pray that you would use these verses to stir us up and fire us up and motivate us to live for you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take your light and shine it in this dark world. Oh God, I pray if anyone's lost their fire, that you would help them see that they've quenched their own spirit. But Lord, we know you can help us. We know that you can reinvigorate us. Lord, I just ask that you would relight our fire for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.